On this podcast, we go one step beyond publications and guidelines to speak directly with leading experts in interventional pulmonology. This podcast will address not only fundamental topics in exciting publications, but also unconventional topics for which the evidence base isn't that robust. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the speaker and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. This is your host, Odit Chadda, an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And with that, let's dive into the next episode. During the peak time of this COVID crisis, most of us, if not all of us, have stopped doing non-urgent bronchoscopies. The lack of procedures have led to a lack of available data and a lack of guidance from professional societies. The AAPIP recently released a set of recommendations, which I'm sure you all have read. This remains a moving target though, and what we do today, including which bronchoscopies we do, what personal protective equipment we use, and whether we, whether we should or should not be bronching COVID positive patients may change tomorrow. So today it's Sunday, March 29th, and it's my honor to introduce uh, on this podcast, a true giant in our field. Dr. Tim Murgu is a professor of medicine and the director of the Interventional Pulmonology Fellowship at the University of Chicago in Chicago, Illinois. He's also the current president-elect of the AABIP, the chair of the education committee at CHEST, and a forever mentor for a lot of practicing interventional pulmonologists like me. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Murgu. Hi, Murat. Thank you for having me, and I appreciate the kind introduction. And uh, I don't know if anyone has called me a giant before, but thank you. All right. So before we get started, Dr. Murgu, do you have any conflicts of interest that you would like, like to disclose? So I do work for University of Chicago, and as you mentioned, I have a leadership position in the ABIP, and I'm the chair of education committee at CHEST. But uh, whatever we say here today, whatever I say here today, are my opinions, hopefully informed opinions from my review of the literature and understanding of current evidence. Uh, and they do not represent the position of the University of Chicago, ABIP, or CHEST. In regards to uh, financial conflicts of interest, I am an educational consultant for Boston Scientific, Olympus, Pinnacle Biologics, Cook, and uh, Johnson & Johnson. Perfect, thank you. So let's get started with a WHO recommendation on testing. So a number of factors could lead to a negative test result in an infected individual, including poor quality of sample collection, or poor quality of the sample containing little patient material. The specimen could be collected too late or too early in the infection. If the specimen was not handled properly or shipped appropriately, we could get a false negative. And there could be technical reasons in the test like viral mutations, PCR inhibition, etc. But if a negative result is obtained from a patient with a high index of suspicion for COVID-19 viral infection, particularly when only upper respiratory tract specimens were collected, Additional specimens, including those from the lower respiratory tract, if possible, should be collected and tested. Now, this is from the WHO. Dr. Murgu, what kind of lower respiratory tract sampling do you think they are recommending? And is there a role for bronchoscopy in patients with COVID? I think you're asking me two completely different questions here. The, the first one, I suspect is pertinent to the role of bronchoscopy for diagnosing uh, COVID. So we uh, we heard of anecdotal reports uh, whereby the nasal or the pharyngeal swabs were negative even twice, and then the bronx sample was positive for SARS-CoV-2 for COVID. Uh, in fact, uh, as uh, I suspect our community continues to stay updated with the literature on the topic, um, JAMA has a bunch of articles, and um, there was a research letter published by investigators from China who reported in their series the BAL um, fluid was positive in 90 plus percent of cases, provided they, they did that in 14. Uh, so the, the, the specimen turned out positive in 14 out of 15 patients. And that, that the positivity rate was actually much higher than the sputum, which was like 70%, or, or the nasal swabs. swabs which was, uh, I believe, like 60% or so. But because bronchoscopy is seen as a aerosol generating procedure, um, the AABIP statement um, that was posted on March 19th 
um, following the CDC recommendations, you know, suggested bronchoscopy should not be routinely used for diagnosing COVID. So I think that's uh, uh, addressing the, um, your first question. Uh, mm -hmm. Sure, lower respiratory tract specimens seem to have a higher accuracy, uh, but given the fact that this is bronchoscopy as of now is seen as an aerosol generating procedure and that puts patients and um, staff at substantial risk. Uh, so for now, the ABIP uh, statement st says, states that um, bronch should really have an extremely limited role in the diagnosing of COVID. That should only be considered in uh, intubated patients if the upper respiratory samples are negative mm -hmm. or, or if you suspect another diagnosis that you know would change clinical management. Mm -hmm. And we go further in saying that the non-BAL specimen uh, should be attempted. And by that, we're referring to tracheal aspirates or, um, or mini-BALs. As for the second question, um, if a patient is already COVID positive, then um, I would say that the role of bronchoscopy is for emergent and urgent procedures. And I know there may be some debate about how to define that, but uh, in the ABIP statement, uh, there is a nice summary of what constitutes emergent, urgent, and non-urgent bronx. And the table is posted online. And that may be useful for practitioners now, since uh, the American College of uh, Surgeons and the U.S. Surgeon General recommend to postpone non-urgent procedures. Uh, by the way, um, since there is some confusion in terms of terminology, um, at my institutions, uh, some surgeons are using the term uh, medically necessary time-sensitive interventions. Mm -hmm. So when we actually make a request for approving a procedure, the, that is the preferred terminology, and we need to justify that our intervention is medically necessary and time-sensitive. I, I hope that's answering your Absolutely. question. <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, even with my personal communications with other providers, I don't think anyone is routinely doing BALs to diagnose COVID positive patients. Okay, so that's from the diagnostic aspect, but we've heard a lot from the therapeutic aspect uh, from China. And again, again, not these are conflicting reports. There's no good physiological backing rationale here, but there have been reports of these patients often having tick secretions and benefiting from bronchoscopic therapeutic suctioning. Could you please comment on this? Yeah, I heard the, I heard the same thing that in uh, Wuhan, doctors have used therapeutic bronch with aspirational secretions for, for improving oxygenation. Like, I've seen email threads, you know, talking about the lung clean team. Um, apparently, uh, apparently there is, this experience has been published in Chinese literature. I have not seen anything in peer-reviewed uh, English literature. Um, and I'm also hearing that some of our peers in Spain uh, shared a similar experience through social media. But mm -hmm. in, the, in the literature that I'm aware of, you know, the, the major cause of hypoxemia in these patients is not a VQ mismatch from secretions. It's really the ARDS as highlighted in several publications. Uh, well, as, well, I think we're still learning about the pathogenesis of respiratory failure in these patients. You know, it seems like it's more related to a cytokine storm and not mucus plugging. There is a JAMA research letter from uh, the initial experience with critically ill patients in Washington state. Um, and atelectasis was seen only in like one out of 20 something patients. So it's like 5%. Mm -hmm. um, as we all know, the majority of the patients have either radicular nodular or groundless opacity. So, you know, this this concept of thick secretions may lead to higher mortality. I, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. really evidence-based right now, at least based on uh, what's been published today. So um, the presence of thick secretions in these patients, you know, makes me wonder um, whether bronchodilators are administered correctly and routinely. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Because... Uh, as you know, medication administration via NEBS um, may be avoided, you know, maybe since it's considered an aerosol generating procedure. So, um, you know, I don't know if that's actually a, maybe a change of practice in terms of how we provide 
um, bronchodilators to uh, to patients under ventilator. Uh, and I'm going to say now that you know that surgical mask and eye protection should be should be worn by all care workers, you know, who come in close contact with COVID patients. And if we provide nebulizations or high flow oxygen, non-invasive ventilation, suctioning, and, mm -hmm. and bronchoscopy intubation, you know, then an N95 should be worn as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, it's a long answer to to that question, but I don't um, I don't think it's an evidence based statement. It may be anecdotal reports from some some of our peers, and not justified by what's published to date in terms of pathogenesis of respiratory failure in COVID patients. Now, okay. that being said, you know, if if it comes to an emergent mucus plugging in someone who's intubated, COVID positive or not. And patient is not responding to usual um, chest physiotherapy or uh, suctioning and percussion. Then maybe, then maybe there is a role for doing a bronchoscopy for that, just like you would do for mm -hmm. other mucus plugs or or blood clots. Exactly. So don't just kick, we don't just stick the scope down there all the time to look for tick secretions. If there is evidence of volume loss, maybe that would be a good rationale to uh, look for a mucus plug in those situations. Yeah, I mean, we have data from the 80s. I mean, I don't want to pontificate on this too much, but um, not COVID related, of course, but mm -hmm. there is data from the 80s that um, bronchoscopy for atelectasis does not actually improve outcomes when you compare it with routine mm -hmm. uh, chest physiotherapy. So I think we'll learn more about this, but that's my opinion at this time, based on my understanding of the literature. Absolutely. So if we do do, you know, regular bronchosco uh, bronchoscopy on these patients, there's obviously concern about exposing our staff to the virus after the procedure during the cleaning process. So at my institution, what we do is we use an enzymatic concentrate with alcohol for a pre-clean pre to clean off any bio burden once we're done with the bronchoscopy. But this isn't necessarily sidled to the virus. Uh, so what we then do is we use a hydrogen peroxide based solution from a machine or a high level disinfection cleaning process. Uh, the challenge is that uh, viral contamination can still remain until we get to the HLD cleaning unit. So again, um, are you aware of any steps that we can take to ensure that our staff is not exposed during this cleaning process? And let me uh, add a second limb to that question. If we do a bronc on a confirmed or suspected COVID positive patient, should we make every effort to ensure that we use a disposable scope? I don't know if I'm entitled to competently answer the question of scope processing and sterilization, um, but uh, I can see the concern, given how common the infection among healthcare workers was in China. So therefore, yes, we should be extremely cautious here. But um, <clears throat> all I can say is that in the in the statement I'm referring to, um, the AABIP statement, um, we recommend that disposable scope should be um, should be used first um, as the first line if available. Um, and then in regards to processing, institutions should follow standards for high level disinfection uh, for the reusable scopes. Um, Perfect. So, <clears throat> I mean, and then in terms of, I mean, there is another component to this, you know, in terms of protecting our peers, mm -hmm. uh, we should limit the number of people involved in, uh, in the procedure. And the procedure mm -hmm. should be done by the most experienced person to reduce the time of exposure. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't know if I answer your specific questions in regards to disinfection. I guess I have to follow the bronchoscope again through the entire process to give mm -hmm. you a more competent answer. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Marco. So uh, just alluding to your previous point, then what about rigid bronchoscopy? I mean, because, you know, even if we do a spontaneous assisted uh, neuromuscular blockade, we never have a perfect seal. Uh, so are you, if you have an emergent airway debulking case, are you trying to do it through the flexible scope? We, we need to do what we have to do <laughs> Yeah. to provide, to provide optimal care to our patients. I mean, if someone has a critical airway obstruction or a tracheoesophageal fistula or a hemoptysis that, you know, I believe in my best judgment that they, that the patient needs an emergent bronch, mm -hmm. then we need to intervene. And, um, again, the decision to go for uh, rigid and or flexible, I guess it depends on uh, people's not only expertise, but uh, judgment that particular day on how they can handle that issue. 
uh, and I do, wa I do not want to get into anecdotal evidence, but during the pandemic, we had to go to the operating room mm -hmm. and uh, use uh, and use rigid bronchoscopes. So, um, you know, that was my call that particular day, and mm -hmm. uh, we did our best to protect ourselves and the staff. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I am definitely not lucky my rigid bronchoscope, um, mm -hmm. as there are clear indications for rigid bronchoscopy. And I just think we need to be very, very careful when we perform any bronchoscopy in these patients during the pandemic. Um, all right. So um, you alluded to this too. What about the kind of PPE that you're using during bronchoscopy? Is it, uh, are you using papers at all or is it N95s? I do not use paper. I use an N95, uh, but that is because I shaved, got rid of my beard. <laughs> Uh, during the during the pandemic, um, as you may or may not recall, when you go to occupational health, if you fail the N95, either because of uh, facial hair or whatever morphology, um, then uh, you qualify for a paper. Um, I do not know if during this pandemic hospitals will actually have the ability to provide papers to people involved in uh, in bronchoscopies. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, all I can say is that, you know, the healthcare team performing bronchoscopies during this time should wear the appropriate appropriate PPE. And that's that's right now based on CDC recommendations and every guideline from societies you read, it should be gown, glove, respiratory protection and eye protection. And when it comes to respiratory protection, Sure, the paper is one of them, but uh, N95 with an eye protection and face shield is recommended as well. Uh, mm -hmm. The other, the other important aspect here is, of course, and this may be, this may be somewhat of a limiting factor, but this the bronch should be done ideally in a negative pressure, mm -hmm. um, in a negative pressure room, and it's not just the bronchoscopy. Okay, I mean when when you read the guidelines from SCCM or, and others, um, any procedure with the risk of uh, aerosolization, like intubation, extubation, tracheostomy, uh, those teams should have N95 uh, during those procedures. And Absolutely. again, limiting the number of people that's performing the intervention, so. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I think it's the same at my institution too. We, we have uh, been recommended to use N95s because PAPRs are one difficult to access. Mm -hmm. And there's also concern about doffing the papers in an uncontaminated, clean way. I don't know of anyone personally in the United States who is consistently using uh, papers for their bronchoscopy. So bronchoscopy suites in the U.S. are capable of being negative pressure rooms. But Dr. Murku, for our international audience who may not always have a negative pressure room, or let's say somebody is in an ICU which is not a negative pressure room, what can they do? And uh, you know, this can we extend this to all bronchoscopies with the community prevalence increasing? Yes, ideally, all bronchoscopies in suspected or confirmed COVID patients should be done in a negative pressure room. But the practice may not be feasible given the high number of hospitalized patients, uh, many in intensive care units, and you know, once a facility runs out of negative pressure rooms and the patient needs a bronch, then, then what? And I don't know if that's necessarily applicable to other countries. I think it's increasingly a relevant question for the United States as well. So I am told, and again, this is uh, anecdotal evidence, that uh, <coughs> institutions are starting to use um, high flow nasal cannula in critically ill patients. And because of that concern for aerosolization, um, if the room is not a negative pressure room, um, ICU docs uh, use a HEPA filter, high efficiency particulate air filters, which could capture you know a portion of the of the viral particles. Now, I this is not evidence based. Uh, it's not clear to me at all whether this practice actually helps, as we know viruses are much smaller than what the filter can can capture, but. That being said, you know, the SCCM guidelines on COVID-19, and they're in the public domain right now, uh, they do say that for aerosol generating procedures, bronchoscopy included, uh, first, we should uh, locate the patient in a negative pressure room, of course, 
uh, or a normal pressure room, but with a, what they call a strict door policy. So that's a single room, door closed, away from high risk patients, you know, every time we do a, a aerosol generating procedure. Um, and they do mention that, uh, um, again, the room should be either negative pressure or, or a room with a HEPA filter. Um, so while the evidence is not strong, you know, that may, may help, it probably doesn't hurt. And uh, it's recommended by the SCCM guidelines on, on COVID-19. So I guess that may be a, that may be a acceptable alternative uh, once negative pressure rooms are not available for our bronchoscopies. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, you you sort of alluded to this again, uh, but let me just talk about bronchoscopies in general, not necessarily COVID positive patients. So a lot of our resources, like the PACU space, the providers, the nurses, all of this is being diverted now to COVID positive patient care. Um, and as the crisis escalates to its peak, what indications do you recommend that we use for continuing to do regular bronchoscopies? Now, let's presume that these patients are COVID negative, which is, of course, hard given that asymptomatic carriage is so high right now in the, in, in the community, especially in New York City. Um, and my institution's current policy is to test everyone, even if they are asymptomatic prior to an endoscopy. Of course, this is a moving target and things might change tomorrow. Uh, but in your opinion, um, right now, uh, you mentioned the ABIP statement. Could you please enlist some prominent indications why you would continue doing bronchoscopies uh, on people who are not COVID positive or suspected to be COVID positive? I think it's clear for every clinician that emergent cases must be taken care of. I don't think anyone doubts that. And I, I trust the community knows what an emergent bronchoscopy is comprised of. Um, there, the table from AABIB lists a couple of examples. It may not be complete, but it gives people an idea on uh, <clears throat> when we need to go and intervene emergently. I mean, you know, tracheal stenosis, uh, the massive hemoptysis, uh, stent migration, you know, tracheoesophageal fistula, or an air leak that patients cannot ventilate and, you know, needs uh, valves or other interventions. I think those are those are clear to to our IP community. The ones where people may struggle are the so-called, you know, urgent or again medically necessary time sensitive interventions. And there, <clears throat> ABIP has um, um, a list as well. Um, if for those of you who are accessing the statement and look at the table, that's the table in the middle, and that includes a lung a lung mass or Intestinal laminopathy, a foreign object aspiration, you know, or, or doing a bronchoscopy in a immunosuppressed patient uh, that requires uh, a lavage. There is also the statement from the American College of Surgeons, for those of you who are not um, familiar with that, I think was posted on March 24th. Um, and they do have an entire category on semi urgent settings. Um, and those procedures include lung nodules greater than two centimeters in size um, or node positive lung cancer as seen on imaging. Um, so in other words, if you're thinking locally advanced cancer or you're suspecting a cancer with a high risk of progression in the weeks to come, um, mm -hmm. then um, then the procedure needs to be done because uh, those procedures will um, affect immediate treatment. In fact, uh, the American College of Surgeons does actually recommend diagnostic or staging procedures that are necessary to initiate treatment. So sure, you know, as the pandemic unfortunately is evolving in this country, um, this group of procedures may, <clears throat> may need to be adjusted and needs to be filtered through people's own judgment and resources. Uh, but it may come to the point where you know we need to um, we need to justify our decision making with evidence um, in front of our administrators and supervisors when we get approvals for these interventions. Um, oh. I was recently asked to do that, and mm -hmm. I've done it successfully by justifying the rate of stent migration in a patient that's responding to chemo and radiation therapy. Mm -hmm. 
once the stent becomes loose on our routine surveillance bronchoscopy, now there, there, there may be indication for stent removal. And it's only one example, but imagine looking at the CT pad and seeing a tumor that's larger than three centimeters or central, or there is already N1 disease. And you know, it's a matter of weeks until that patient may progress from a three, two a, two B to a three A or to a three B. Mm-hmm. You know, those are those are cases that we need to intervene and do our best to intervene in a timely fashion. Um, as for as for your second question there with COVID testing prior to each bronch, I, I really don't have an answer. I think mm-hmm. things are in flux. Last time I checked, CDC offered some guidance, but to my understanding, the decision on whom to test is really based on local and state health department policies. Yes, just to clarify, that's uh, the policy at my institution, and there is uh, no good evidence to back whether this is the right or wrong approach. It's just given the uh, suspected rate of high asymptomatic community prevalence that we have in New York City, that everyone is being tested, even if asymptomatic, prior to an endoscopy. Before we close this out, do you have any uh, closing comments that you would like to make? <laughs> uh, sure. I mean, you know, I, I ju- I'm just going gonna, to gonna paraphrase the, the director of WHO, uh, Tedros Ghebreyesus, I think is his name. You know, there, there is a lot of fear, rumors, and stigma now, but our greatest assets are facts, reason, and solidarity. So let's stand together and for the time being, Let's stay apart. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Perfect, thank, you for, perfect. thank you for having me with it. Thank you, Dr. Murgo. I know these are difficult and busy times, and we really appreciate your time and your expertise during these uh, challenging and non evidence based times. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me, and stay safe. With that, we conclude an exciting episode here on the AABIP podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed hosting it. Do also check out our website ippodcast.com and please do provide us with feedback and suggestions on what topic and which expert you want to hear next. Until next time, take care.